Hello, this is Michael Sulak, and this video is all about an idea called the sampling distribution of p hat. What's p hat? In words, it's the sample proportion, and in symbols, it's a p with this thing on top. You can call that the hat, kind of looks like an arrow or a carrot. So let's jump right in. So first off, if you want to find a sample proportion, you need two numbers. You need a count of how many individuals in your sample have a certain characteristic. Sometimes that gets called X, and then you put that over the size of your entire sample, which typically gets called N. For example, suppose you sample a total of 40 Denver residents and 22 of them report they own a dog. So the particular characteristic that we're looking at is do you own a dog? And we have 22 people that do own a dog out of a total of 40. So our sample proportion is 55%. Nothing crazy about that. That's just finding one sample proportion. But suppose you took another sample with 40 residents, 40 different residents, would you get p hat equals 55% again? Probably not. We would be sampling from different people and the number of them that owned a dog probably would not equal 22. If we took a different sample, we would likely get a different value of p hat. And then imagine what if we took a lot of samples? from the same population with the same variable. So each one of these arrows is representing the idea of collecting 40 people and finding out what proportion of them own a dog, taking many samples and finding many p hats. And you can imagine that we wouldn't get the same value every time. We're gonna get different sample proportions. And since different samples give us different p hats, we can consider p hat a variable p hat varies. It's not always the same, just like the color of a car varies or the height of a person is a variable. Our sample proportion is also a variable. And there is a very important idea in statistics called the central limit theorem that's going to give us important information about what happens if you collected a lot of different random samples and found the sample proportion for each one of those. It's called central limit theorem because it is central to the subject of statistics. So first of all, if we made a distribution of all these p hats, so basically collected them all and looked at if we saw any patterns, the central limit theorem says that the shape of this distribution will be normal. Normal meaning Gaussian, bell-shaped, and this bell-shaped curve that represents a lot of different p hats from the same population is what this video is all about, the sampling distribution of p hat. And sometimes the word sampling can be a little bit confusing, so I might just call it the distribution of p hat. Either way, I'm referring to the same thing. And this is what the central limit theorem tells us what the pattern we would see. We would get this bell-shaped curve where the height of the curve more or less represents the tendency that p hat will be a certain value. So right here in the middle is the most likely values of p hat. And the higher the values of p hat get, the less likely. And also the lower the values of p hat, the less likely. And that's true about any variable that has a normal distribution. And just to get slightly more specific about what this thing means, how many samples is the distribution of p hat referring to? Well, it's referring to all the possible p hats you could take from a given population. And typically that's a lot. If you think about if you were sampling 40 Denver residents, there's maybe a million Denver residents and the amount of groups of 40 of them you could have is quite a few. So, And so when you're actually conducting statistics, you don't go out there and take a lot of different samples. In practice, we usually only take one sample. Say something like this because of the central limit theorem and the distribution of p hat. 
it is unlikely to sample 40 Denver residents and observe dog ownership of P hat equals 100%. Because of the central limit theorem, a statement like this is true. Although you could kind of say, hey, I didn't need to know the central limit theorem to know that it's unlikely that everybody I sample will own a dog. And I think that's a nice thing about this whole idea is that some of the important concepts are somewhat intuitive. And I think that's a nice thing about statistics in general. And so a value of 100% for p hat would be unlikely, but it's often useful to know what value of p hat is most likely. To explore the idea of the most likely value, Imagine sampling from a large bag of marbles where you know that 60% of all the marbles are black. That's capital P is 60%. So if we were sampling from that bag of marbles and finding the sample proportion of black marbles, which of the following P hats seems more likely? 10% or 50% or 100%? Remember that 60% of all the marbles in the bag are black. And because of that, a sample proportion of 10% or 100% are what we could refer to as extreme outcomes. They're somewhat unusual. Since it is closer to the actual proportion of black marbles in the bag, a sample proportion of 50% is more likely. The values of 10% and 100% are further from the true population proportion of 60%. What is the most likely sample proportion? And this is a really intuitive result, I think. Since 60% of all the marbles in the bag are black, a sample proportion of 60% is the single most likely sample proportion to observe. It's certainly not guaranteed, but if you had to bet on what value of the sample proportion you would see, 60% would be the number you should put your money on. So we could say 60% is the most likely value of p hat for this bag of marbles. 60% is the expected value of p hat. On average, the central limit theorem tells us that we'll get 60%. And what this looks like in symbols, we're going to call the average value of p hat mu with a subscript p hat on it and that equals whatever the population proportion is. And so what that looks like if we put it together with our normal distribution, 60% would be that number that's right in the middle. And the further sample proportions above or below 60%, the less likely those values will be. Could say things like half the time p hat will be more than 60% for this bag of marbles. We could say the probability of getting a p hat more than 60% is one half. And what's really nice about the central limit theorem is that it allows us to talk about all possible samples without doing any sampling at all. When we knew that 60% of the entire bag was black, we know that in the future, the probability, this proportion of black marbles in that sample will be more than 60% is one half. And we didn't have to even do any sampling. We just needed to know what was going on with the bag. And that's kind of a beautiful result. So, so far, the central limit theorem has told us the following facts about the sampling distribution of p hat. We know that the shape is normal. And then we also know that the middle of that distribution, the expected value, is equal to the proportion of the entire population. And so what this looks like in a slightly nicer picture is the population proportion is right in the middle of the sampling distribution of p hat. p hat is a variable. And so let's do an example problem related to the sampling distribution of p hat. Suppose it is known that 30% of all Denver residents are dog owners. If we sample 40 residents, here's a few problems we're going to be looking at. If you want to try to do these on your own right now, that might be a good idea. From what you've seen in this video, you should be able to do the first three problems. 
So let's get started on answering these questions. The first one is the easiest. Find the mean of the sampling distribution of p hat. Well, since the mean of p hat is equal to the population proportion, then that means the mu of p hat equals 30%. And the second question reminds us what that is. If we're told to sketch the distribution of p hat, well, that's a bell-shaped curve. It doesn't look super nice in my picture, but it's just a sketch. And in the middle of that curve comes the mean of 30%. Now we're asked, what is the probability that more than 12 residents in our sample own a dog? And that's a question about a count related to our sample. And what we want to do is take that count and translate it into a proportion. 12 residents out of 40 means that p hat would be 12 over 40, which would be 30%. If we're looking for more than 12, that means p hat being more than 30% we just needed to translate that into a proportion. And I always recommend drawing a picture as well, taking a second to make a little sketch and shade in the area that you're trying to find. So we're trying to find this area here and we got a little lucky with this question because 30% is the exact middle of this distribution and we're trying to find the area to the right of the exact middle that is 50%, no formulas or calculators needed percent. And sometimes it can be a little confusing because the variable that we're working with is a proportion which a lot of times we will talk about as a percentage but also the answer is typically given as a percentage as well. So let's keep going. What is the probability more than eight residents in our sample report they own a dog? More than eight is p hat more than eight out of 40, which is a sample proportion now of more than 20%. 30% was right in the middle, which means that 20% is to the left of the middle. And so that means that the area to the right of 20% is gonna be more than a half. And right now we don't actually have the tools that we need to answer this question. We know that it's more than a half, but there's something else that we need to bring in to this problem now. And what we need is the variability of p hat. How much tendency is there for p hat to be above or below average? As a reminder, if we're talking about a quantitative variable in statistics, and we want a number that tells us how variable this quantity is, we use the standard deviation. And this is where you have to be a little bit careful because we could talk about, like we've done before, what gets called sometimes the standard deviation of a population. If our variable was height, this would be referring to the height of one person. Something like income has a higher standard deviation than height because income varies a lot more than how tall people are. I mean, some people have billions of dollars. That's a huge amount of variation. Nobody is billions of feet high. That would be a very tall person. Now we can talk about the standard deviation of the sample proportion. And that's going to be sigma like we used before, but we're going to put a subscript p hat on it. Sigma of p hat is the tendency for the sample proportion to be different from average. And so this is a quantity that has a formula. And what that formula looks like is where p is the population proportion and n is the sample size. And an important thing to notice is that the variability of the sample proportion depends on the population proportion because that's in this formula, but it also depends on the sample size, n. As a statistician, that's something that you potentially have control over. The population proportion is a characteristic of your population that's not changeable. 
but the sample size is something that could potentially be changed. And this is a fraction with the sample size on the bottom, which means that if you have a larger sample, what happens with a fraction when the bottom gets bigger is that the entire fraction gets smaller. Let's look at that in another way. The bigger the sample, the less variability of p hat. And that can be useful if you're trying to estimate a population proportion. The larger the sample you take, the greater the tendency for your sample proportion to be close to the population proportion, which is a good thing. We're now ready to go back to our question of what's the probability that more than eight Denver residents in our sample report they own a dog. We're gonna need to calculate the standard deviation of p hat to find this area. So, okay, because we know that 30% of all Denver residents are dog owners, that's our P, that's 30%. We need to use the decimal equivalent of that. So here's our P times one minus P over our sample size. And eventually we're gonna take the square root, but that's the very last thing we do. We'll do the subtraction first, that gives us 0.7. We'll multiply these two numbers next, that gives us 0.21. We'll divide by 40 next, that gives us 0 0.00525. And then lastly, we'll take the square root, which gives us 0 0.0725. That is our standard deviation of the sample proportion. And so now we can have a more complete picture of what the distribution of p hat looks like. Now we know the standard deviation and so we could say things like one standard deviation below the mean would be 22.75%, which means that the p hat value that we're interested in right now is down here. It's further below the mean than just one standard deviation. Finding the standard deviation of p hat is the last piece of the puzzle. It's the last piece of information we need to find any probability related to the sample proportion. Let's look at 20% and figure out exactly how far below the average it is, how many standard deviations. And so to know exactly how many standard deviations 20% is, we can find a z-score. It turns out that if you ever want to find a z-score for a value of the sample proportion, you can use a formula that looks like this. And this is actually the same format as any z-score. We take the value of the variable, we subtract its mean, and we divide by its standard deviation. This process is called normalizing it. So let's do that. So we had our p hat value of 20%. So the z-score is take 20% as a decimal, subtract 0.3 because that's 30% as a decimal, divide by our standard deviation as a decimal. And when you do that, you get the z-score for p hat equals 20%. It's negative and it's negative 1.38. What that tells us now is that our value of 20% is exactly 1.38 standard deviations below the mean. The goal is to find this area here, but now we're getting closer to being able to do that. And it turns out that you can find this in two ways. You can just use the distribution of p hat directly. This is my favorite way to do it because typically this is a little bit less work or, and this is the method that a lot of textbooks do, they take any normally distributed variable and they turn it into a z-score. It's really up to you. If it were me, I would just go right to the distribution of p hat. And this is assuming that you have a computer or a calculator or something that allows you to work with a normal distribution that has some specified mean and standard deviation. So let's just jump into what these two different methods look like. So if we're using the distribution of p hat, we're trying to find the probability that p hat is more than 20%. So we could find the area to the right of 20% using this mean and this standard deviation. Or 
we could use the standard normal distribution and find the probability that a z-score is more than negative 1.38. And whichever one of these methods we want to use, we'll get the same number. They're the same value. So you have a choice. And as a quick reminder, there are many, many ways to find the area under a normal distribution. If you're using a TI-83 or a TI-84, you hit the second button and then the button called VARS. And then you get a menu of different items and we're looking for normal CDF, not PDF, which if you're curious stands for cumulative density function. So here's what it looks like using normal CDF. This is exactly what you see in a TI-83. A TI-84 looks slightly different, but you still need four numbers. And the first two numbers are for the area that you want. So we're telling it to start here and to keep going for a very long time until we get to all the way to 1,000, which is crazy far this way. You just need a big number here. You had to use 0.2 here because we needed to start there. And then the key here is that we're working with the distribution of p hat. So we need to give the mean of p hat as the third value and the standard deviation of p hat as the fourth value. And if you wanted to do this same sort of calculation with a standard normal distribution, you would use your z-score as the start. And now we use the mean and the standard deviation of the standard normal distribution. And obviously you wouldn't do both of these calculations. We're going to get the same number. My preferred method is the method on the left because it's a little bit quicker. I could have used this method without ever calculating a z-score. And regardless, we get the same result. We get 0 0.916, 91.6%. Because this 91.6% is the area to the right of 20% for the sampling distribution of p-hat, which is dependent on the sample size and the population proportion. So if either one of those numbers changed, then the area to the right of 20% wouldn't be 91.6% anymore. So summarizing what's going on here, we just looked at the concept of the sampling distribution of p-hat. It's important for knowing what a sample says about the entire population, which is really one of the biggest themes of statistics. And it turns out that there's two main types of techniques in statistics that use sampling distributions, confidence intervals, where you're trying to estimate the value of your parameter by using an interval instead of just one number. And the second one is called hypothesis tests or hypothesis testing, where you're trying to test some claim about a parameter. I have lots of videos on both confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. And so if we wanted to make an inference for a population proportion, then we use the sampling distribution of p-hat. If we want to make inference either estimating or testing a researcher's claim in a hypothesis test for a mean being mu, then we use a sampling distribution, but we'll use the sampling distribution of the sample mean instead of x-bar. Basically just the idea that the sample mean varies just like the sample proportion varies. So these are two statistics where sampling distributions are extremely useful to make inferences about their corresponding parameters. And one really cool thing is that the central limit theorem applies to any statistic. So a statistic meaning a number that you calculate from a sample. If you calculate the same kind of number from multiple samples, the central limit theorem tells you that whether that's a mean or a proportion or even something like a standard deviation, that statistic will be normal, will be bell-shaped, which is really cool, I think. So summarizing what we've learned, we've talked about the sampling distribution of p-hat, which has a normal shape. If your sample size is big enough, your population is big enough compared to your sample, and your sample is taken randomly. And that distribution has a middle, which we can call mu of p-hat, and mu 
of p hat is just whatever the population proportion is and that normal distribution has a standard deviation which we call sigma of p hat one of the really important ideas that comes up here is that as the sample size increases the standard deviation decreases a larger sample ends up with this curve being more peaked in the middle and a smaller sample gives you a curve that's more squished flat has more area on the outsides so a lot of times when you want to estimate things more precisely one thing you can do is increase your sample size. So that is the sampling distribution of p hat, uh, the idea of how does the sample proportion vary, and it's an important idea for statistics. If you have any questions, please leave a comment. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up button. This is Michael Sulak, and I will see you next time.